Hey everybody, this is Z Tanoko. And I'm Richard Reeves. You're, You're listening, listening to Leading with Insight. Join us as we explore the latest trends, insights, and strategies for people who love leadership. Get ready to unlock your full potential and take your career to the next level. In this episode, we'll be unpacking how your personality lends itself to your leadership skills. Uh, but first, before we jump into that, Z, did you have any idea how much your personality actually influences the way you lead? I have a lot of ideas around that. Yes. Um, no, it 100% does, right? We are who we are. We grew up in our environment, our surroundings, um, and some of us are more introvert than extrovert. Um, I consider myself an introvert extrovert. You know, there's certain surroundings. I'm more quiet, reserved, trying to understand, you know, who's who's around, what what can I say, what I cannot say. But once I'm comfortable, Z, the extrovert, kicks into overdrive, and I just, you know, the life of the party. Uh, but I think it does, right? Because what is what is comfortable for you? What is it that you're, um, that you're, you know, that comes natural to you? But then at the same time, how can you also tone it down or, you know, amp it up a little bit? And, you know, I like to call how do you flex your different styles um, to be able to communicate effectively with your team, with other leaders, you know, when you have uh, an important presentation or you need to persuade. I mean, the list goes on. So I would say 100 um, percent. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. What are some techniques, best, best practices and things we need to be aware about uh, when we're leading and leveraging our personality and the different traits that we have. So I think I said yes in a long way. Yes, I did know. And I already knew the answer to that because you're an amazing leader. So uh, I set you up for that. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, in addition to that, what we'll be unpacking is how personality influences your leadership skills and your style. And also it's some just to keep an eye on some unconscious biases that your personality may or may not um, have. In addition to that, what we'll be talking about is how important it is to keep emotional intelligence in the forefront, especially when dealing with multiple personalities on the team. You know, no two people are the same. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good, good layout. So with that, we also have a special guest. Uh, we want to give a warm Leading with Insight welcome to this podcast, Elisa Borsetti, who is a Associate General Counsel here at Insight in about three and a half years, if I'm correct and uh, a, a lot more. So with that, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm really sorry to do this, but you did mispronounce my name, Z. <laughs> I've been practicing like 20 times in the field. Borsati. <laughs> Borsati. Borsati. I'm so sorry, but I'm like, I don't... It's so funny. When I, I said that, I looked over, and as our I'm like, I said it wrong, but I'm just going to keep going. Just. <laughs> I'm like, I can't let it, I can't let it lie. I can't let it lie. I'm sorry. No, I, you know what? And I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I would want you to correct me. So yes, Borsati, okay. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, See, I'm so happy to be here. So for those who um, don't work here at Inside or maybe have, haven't had the opportunity to meet you or work with you here, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for, for Insight? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, as you said, Associate General Counsel. I manage a team of amazing contract managers, three of them. And together, we support all aspects of the client contracts process. So from inception of creating a contract and you know, kind of sending that out, having clients review it, reviewing red lines, basically helping our teams close these deals and get to the finish line while minimizing as much risk to insight as we possibly can. Yeah. Wow. Again, all these different roles that we don't even like think about, right? How important that is. I mean, your team is a, you know, is a big part of what we do and making sure that we have the right documents are right con the, everything is right there for us to make sure that we have a good relationship with our clients and everything is everything is done you know without any hiccups Abs hopefully. yeah absolutely I, I i sometimes tell people that the best experience i had for this role was actually working in customer service and restaurant back in college because we are in customer service for our insight clients the sales teams the pre-sales teams we are their support when they are needing to work with clients, work out these thorny issues, uh, we're, we are there. So I take great pride in uh, in what we do. So I did that. I did uh, do some stalking. I was like, okay, let me see if I can find anything on uh, Lisa. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things I saw on your LinkedIn is that you were a speaker for like I think it was WIC uh, 2023 event for ESGs or something. Yeah. How did that go? What, yeah, that it was great. You know, and I I was so pleased to be involved because one of the things that I love about uh, the building, the headquarters building that that I work in, um, 
is when it was all going up, I remember reading stories just about the partnership in the community and what leadership wanted to do in terms of sustainability and outreach. And it made me so proud. And when I walked into the building on the first day, I kind of had this, you know, first day of school situation where I'm like, I I can't believe I go here. You know, it was very exciting. Um, But then in the back of my mind thinking, this place is such a powerhouse and working for a company that is actually concerned about being a responsible corporate citizen and our role in the community that really resonates with me and so I was just all too happy to kind of uh, preach the gospel of insight so to speak so yeah very happy to be involved and you're doing it today at this podcast so look at that you're just like all over now amen Z (laughs) (laughs) Uh, another thing I did I I was like I came across I'm like what else is that what else do I don't I know about Lisa um, that's how I came across some voiceover you did and it was like oh my gosh she's got a great voice this should be perfect for this podcast actually we have it now go ahead and roll it no I'm just kidding <laughs> just kidding I'm like well, you can find that on Percipio <laughs> <laughs> hello welcome yes but um, let's go into that. today's topic about personality <laughs> and, and how that plays into our leadership style um, so uh, we'll start off with that how, how can somebody as a leader um, understand or have that self-awareness of like, hey, what's my style? Like, how do I know what my personality, my communication style is? Um, so we'll start with that. What, what's your experience? What have you done or what have you, uh, what do you recommend for leaders to do if they're curious? Sure. Um, I think a big starting point can just be good old fashioned self-reflection and kind of looking looking into yourself um, and even maybe combining with observing others What about the leaders uh, that we admire resonates with us? What about the leaders that we admire makes us feel like um, they are effective? Um, Things that speak to us in the way we also do things or the, the, you know, similarities in the way we approach things, right? Um, There's also some really fun tools out there. Um, So you can do these assessments. Big Five is one that a lot of people know about. Um, Myers-Briggs has been around forever. Um, And the DISC assessment, which I actually did the for the first time at Insight a couple of years ago. And that was really, really interesting because um, I feel like maybe it's a rarity where people have very consistent, it's like this bar chart and, you know, most people that, we we shared it in our group and most people had a bar that was really high on one aspect. And it's like, oh, how do I break this down? Especially when, you know, somebody brings back a big dominance one. They're like, I don't even feel like I'm like that, you know? And it's like, no, it's, it's not, it's just a category that you can break down into these sort of component parts and that can help guide you uh, in your understanding of, you know, who you are as a leader and kind of how you approach problems, things like that. Yeah. No. And again, that's, that's, those are already good right there, right? Off the bat. I love that self-reflecting, just be observant, be, be present. I think that's a big hard, a, a difficult for a lot of us leaders as we are running a hundred miles an hour. We were just talking beforehand, like, Oh my gosh, I was so looking for this. Cause I kind of get a break. Um, <laughs> But the thing about it is that, yeah, we need to be present and kind of make those observations. And one of, we'll talk about one of the tools that I use is called speed reading when I'm trying to adjust to others. Because honestly, people are giving us cute clues all the time. Like if you really pay attention, they're telling us, whoa, slow down, you're going too fast. Or, you know, can you speak up a little? Whatever. You can just tell by these different cues they're giving you, but we just need to be present. So I love that. Self-awareness, self-assessment. Uh, taking the time and a lot of trainings if you ever done leadership training isn't there a lot of self-reflecting that happens in trainings like what's your why what are your values yeah so much (laughs) and if if you're a person who maybe tends towards excessive self-reflection or occasionally has a bout of imposter syndrome or anxiety you look back at those times and you're like did i really say and or do that um but it can be helpful because despite maybe the abject horror that you feel that that's actually what happened, you can learn from it and you can move on and you can you can really have that growth come from within because you lived it, you, you know, uncomfortably maybe confronted it and you can let it kind of guide your path going forward. 100 percent. Yeah. And when it comes to assessments, you definitely call it out several. There's so many out there. Right. The question is. You know, again, leverage them. I mean, I don't think there's any, there's not a better or worse one. It's just, you know, an opportunity for you to look and see and then be curious and ask questions. And then I would just confirm with your, your, your team, your peers, you know, how do you see me when I communicate? And usually, I mean, they usually align spot on. I think whenever I do those trainings, people are like, that is so me. 
Oh my god! It's like reading a fortune cookie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> or your horoscope, right? Like, exactly. How do you know me so well? <laughs> but um, uh, one quick question I do have for you, Lisa. Um, what would you say are some characteristic traits of your personality that you can kind of, that would impact your leadership style? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think when I think of you know, answering that kind of question. I actually feel like the big five is really helpful in, in this in this situation. Um, so for example, and I think Z, you mentioned it before, whether you're more naturally extroverted or more naturally introverted, that is going to impact how presenting and talking to a large group of people, right? Does that exhaust you? Do you find that to be overwhelming? Or are, are you better kind of one-on-one -on -one or kind of working behind the scenes? Or does that make you feel energized and, that, and, and you feel like you're at your best self, right? So that's going to necessarily impact you know, the way you want to hold your meetings, the way you want to communicate with your team, right? Um, your openness to experience. Are, are you more of a risk taker, right? Do you feel more comfortable trying new things? Um, or are you a little bit more cautious? And then depending on the people on your team, if you are or not matched up with them, right, then there may be some work to do in order to get through to those people so that you can all be kind of rowing in the same canoe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was two great examples there. Like, you know, as a leader, there's going to be moments where you have to be extroverted to lead a meeting or you go to a conference or whatever the case may be where you have to be more, ex you know, have, have to be out there speaking constantly um, in front of an audience, right? But, you know, that is definitely not your go-to style or natural style when you're exhausted at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us can maybe, you know, can, can sense that. I mean, for me, it's more when I'm not around people. So if I'm in my desk all day, on spreadsheets or working on pr on pro programs or projects, I'm like, dude, I, I need to go. I need to get out. Like, I need to hang out with people. I need to go hang, you know, go to go and go to a restaurant. Like, you know, give me somebody, anybody. Let's go hang out. Uh, but it's that energy draining. But also, it's the opposite. When you are in your in your in your behavior, personality style, it's that energizing. Afterwards, you just feel like, wow, that was fun, mm -hmm. right? So kind of pay attention to that. So that's a great one, right? To go on that self-reflect and kind of pay attention when those energy is being given or drained. Yeah. Yeah. So good question. Um, so regarding like pitfalls, though, you know, um, it's interesting when I do some of the trainings like DISC. Let's break that. Uh, let's break that down. DISC is not a personality assessment. It's a communication behavior assessment. So it's how you communicate, right? Um, what are some you know pitfalls when it comes to leadership and like? looking at those assessments where it can backfire or you can like maybe see that and it might not be helpful if you look at it of a certain way. Does that make sense? Like if you're looking at it as a leader and going, oh, that's my report and it can, you can see it as a negative instead of a positive, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand what you're getting at, Z. Um, I think, <laughs> I've actually been thinking about this a lot. Okay. I think it's very easy yeah. to get a result and think to yourself, that's my whole story, right? And sort of giving over a little bit too much, I don't know, power or influence to, I mean, it was like a series of uh, a couple questions, right? Yeah. They, I mean, maybe it's more than a couple, but you <laughs> know, you answered some questions and here's what it came out to. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think in the context of leadership as well, where there's so many books about it, there's so much discourse about it. Sometimes it feels like there's so much external pressure on like, here's how to be a good leader, right? And that piece of paper is just another part of that external yeah. puzzle kind of acting on you. And so, you know, I think in a way, if, if you rely too much on it, it can kind of take away some of your agency as a leader um, because you're just, yeah, okay, well, that's that's me and, you know, I don't, uh, whatever. Um, you know, you're you're relinquishing too much of your power. You're giving it too much space. Instead of using it as just another kind of tool in your bag of tricks, um, you know, you don't want to let it dictate yeah. how, um, you know, how you approach things. Because let's be honest, that, that's never going to be a complete picture, right? Yep. It's not situational. It's not taking into account 
you know, days where um, things are going on in your personal life, things are happening um, in the world, you're stressed out, right? You are going to respond differently to this kind of different stimuli and no battery of, you know, of tests or assessment is going to, it's just not going to adequately capture that. And on the other hand, it's not going to capture those times when you've completely risen to the occasion, when people needed you, you supported them. It's, you know, it's just one piece of the puzzle that is you as a leader. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. A lot of that whole self-reflection, I really like how you touched on that. And that kind of leads itself into our next topic about Um, Just recognizing the unconscious biases that we have, you know, uh, every individual has them, right? You know, from the way we grew up to, you know, the schools we went to, to geography, where we're, where we're from, where we're raised, things like that. But um, are are there, uh, can you explain a little bit about how you can kind of identify those unconscious biases and, you know, make sure we mitigate those, you know, in our leadership styles? Yeah, absolutely. I think number one is you just keep it real and get yourself educated. Like know that these biases are there within you. Um, You're not a bad person. It's uh, the brain has to take shortcuts. We are tasking our brains every day with just an impossible load, uh, you know. And so because of that, our brains are constantly making shortcuts in order to identify what needs to be done, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, right? I mean, we're, we're always doing that. So in terms of you know, making yourself aware, educating yourself. There's actually tests for unconscious bias. I've taken them before. And yeah, you... Eye openers. It, it's incredible. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want to think that about yourself. You don't. But it's eye-opening. And you're like, yes, this is... It, it's in all of us. And that is the first step. You, you, you just have to get, I guess, comfortable with being uncomfortable with that truth, right? Yeah. I don't think you make a big call out, right? People tend to say like, oh my gosh, no, I don't have any or whatever. It's like once we get to the point where we're like, hey, this is part of the human nature. It's our brain. It, it takes shortcuts. We have to, you know, have to, it has to decipher things really quickly. But then I love your what you just said, which will answer the question I was going to ask is how can you work on this? And I think right off the bat, just educate yourself, um, you know, t- read books, podcasts, you know, take trainings. There's so much out there. Uh, but for me, I would say is start to learn to be curious, just be curious. And I think that applies even to earlier what you said about um, your results, too, is when you get the results, don't take it so literal or take it like, OK, so this is me. Oh, great. I don't like it. Right. Um, or, OK, I li- this is mine, but I really like yours. I want to be like you. Right. It's like, hey, be yourself, but be just be curious with it. Ask questions. You know, is this really reflecting? Where do I? Where do I see these traits or these behaviors in the real world when I'm talking to people, when I'm reflecting? And you'll probably find out more than more than likely that you, actually it does reflect pretty pretty accurate if you did the assessment right. Um, but yeah, just be curious. I think that's another layer, right? So educate yourself, and then not only that, then be curious to just ask questions and understand. Uh, because if you go into right away like, oh, that's wrong, or there's a right or wrong, or whatever, that will get you in trouble. Right. Absolutely. Well, and in terms of uh, curiosity being a, a bridge to kind of cross over these barriers that bias creates. Mm-hmm. So when you are curious about other people that are different than you, you are inviting those diverse perspectives into your life. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what you need. That's what we all need to do in order to kind of cultivate you know, an environment that is full of diverse perspectives and, yeah. and, you know, managing bias in an appropriate way. So here, I was going to think about quickly on that. Um, let's talk about personality. So how, what are some bias, unconscious biases that could happen? Well, I'll share mine, you know, being a little bit vulnerable. Um, I think we tend to gravitate with people that have similar communication or styles as us, right? you're easy to talk to. I don't have to really flex or adjust my style because I'm like, I totally get you. I, I love being loud and throwing ideas and all that. But this when you talk to others that are more reserved or quiet, you're just like, you know, why are they so quiet? Are they not paying attention? Do they not really want to? Be? And it's again, that's not being curious. That's being more judgmental and kind of already labeling them as somebody who is not collaborating, whatever. So you got to be mindful of that. And that's because they're not the same personality or communication doesn't mean um, that, you know, they're not cooperative or whatever comes to your mind. You got to stop that before it, before it starts becoming something. Were you going to yep. say something on that? No, I thought you were talking about me. you like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all doing all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> no. You totally described me, Z. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I mean, it's similar personality, similar. <laughs> oh, oh, oh yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Maybe, maybe not quite to your extent. Yeah, but, but that, that's one of the things you got to be mindful of, right? Um, is there any other ones that you can think of, unconscious bias, maybe in personalities? Or I, I would say, uh, you know, what are, what are some common challenges that you face when you, you know, maybe you're on a team and you don't address those unconscious biases? Like what, what kind of friction do you see or how do you overcome something like that? Yeah, so I think um, you can end up with a lack of diversity, certainly. Um, this can lead to poor morale. Um, you can kind of get into sort of an echo chamber type situation, right? Where people, um, you know, people feel like they either don't want to or can't speak up. Um, and that really doesn't serve the best interests of the organization whatsoever. Um, because that's, you know, you get into a real kind of communication breakdown. There's a, a lack of uh, trust. There's a feeling that you're not safe. And all of these things really contribute to, um, you know, a team not functioning well and uh, people not really having a great time. On the extreme end of things, I'd be remiss as a lawyer if I didn't say <laughs> it can lead to legal troubles yeah. if, if this has been found to be, yeah. you know, some kind of discriminatory pattern right or you know rising to the level of um yeah discrimination harassment um you know it can really be serious if if continued to you know kind of fester if you will not address it yeah uh, yeah and again not educating yourself right and yeah i think that's where you mentioned again as teams is you know it's really it's a good team builder exercise right when you're when you have a new team maybe you've had a shift in, in teammates or what have you, it's good to come together and get to know each other. That's probably the foundation of trust is getting to know each other. Um, and these assessments help with that, but also helps you, but also then, again, helps address those challenges. Right? Why is there friction? You know, Why can't we communicate more effectively? Well, do you understand their style and have you adjusted your style? And that is actually leads back to the, even going back to that report again, it's interesting when I do these trainings, a lot of teammates, especially leaders, go, okay, Z, but what's like the ideal result for a leader? Like, do I need to up this? Do I need to tone this down? And I'm like, I got an answer for you. Leave it as is. You just have to understand your team style and adjust and give them what they need. In return, they give you what, you know, kind of work together. <laughs> but it's interesting. I get that all the time. I love that. You're like, dude, it's not a video game. You can't just like tweak the What's sliders, the codes, right? right? <laughs> like I'm going to put a couple points over here and I'm going to put a yeah. couple points over there. Let me, let, me, and... let me, you know, let me toss a little bit of money your way. Can you adjust my results? Yeah. Can like... you just like set me to 11 Z? <laughs> ba bow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's the thing you got to be mindful of, right? Is that, um, you know, other unconscious biases I think about, you know, when it comes to your personality to be mindful of. I mean, think about hiring. Um, think about, you know, stretch assignments, those type of things. Like, you just have to check yourself. You know, don't ever jump and assume that someone is not interested or capable. Like, bring it up to them. Hey, you know, this has opened up. You know, you have, you've, you're have you competent. You've shown the skills. Um, what do you think? Kind of get them involved. Don't just be like, oh, they're very quiet. I don't think they want to do this role. It's like, how do you know? Right. You never know. So, exactly. all right. Emotional intelligence. Or is there another? Mm, no, one? that's I was going to okay. say. That was a good segue. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so far we talked about, hey, how can you identify what your personality is? And there's tons of assessments. There's that self, you know, self-reflecting, understanding, getting that feedback. Then we talked about, um, you know, being careful with your unconscious bias. But as we know, there's definitely going to be friction or a lot of emotions happening in meetings and conversations with colleagues. So how does emotional intelligence play when it comes to your personality styles and dealing with conflict or others? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's really, really important as a leader to be someone who is emotionally right intelligent, right? To be kind of deeply in touch with what's going on because I think some of the best leaders that I've worked with are people that when they're put into a situation where everyone around them is, you know, either panicking or upset, they are the voice of calm and they are able to speak to people, you know, whether it's their words or their body language or their style, but you just feel like this person gets it. They're here to help and they're going to help get everybody together to be working in the same direction. So a lot of that is, having a lot of empathy, really being able to empathize with what people are going through. People have different ways and levels at which they perform. 
when confronted with stressors and, and other issues. And so being empathetic and not necessarily going in with expectations of, you know, you are going to be like, the, you know, you're, you're going to deal with it in this certain exact way, right? You got to meet people where they are. And I think an emotionally intelligent leader knows, you know, and, and, and can pick up on how to do that. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, so I have a quick question on that. And it sounds like and maybe you're just an anomaly or you're just very gifted at emotional intelligence. So let, let me ask you this. How, how do you how, how do you what's what are some strategies that leaders can work on their emotional intelligence? And because it, it's not a one and done thing, right? You you don't take an emotional intelligence test and then you're like, oh, OK, well, that's me. I'm yeah, done. You know, how it's do you not fix like most personalities? I mean, you kind of, you know, develop that over time. But the cool thing we're talking about is that EQ is malleable, right? You can work on. So what are some yeah. things that, that we can work on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think just having that kind of growth mindset, that personality, that there are aspects that are not fixed and that if you want to be more emotionally intelligent, that there are, there are things you can do and, and there are things you can do within yourself either by self-reflection or um, seeking out feedback, seeking out training. Sometimes when you go to a training, they may be talking about things that you never really thought about or they, there might be concepts that you didn't really think about in the way that they're being presented. And that can help inform you and kind of guide the way that you want to go in order to, you know, to develop those aspects of your personality and your emotional intelligence and in, in what you want to improve on. Yeah. I mean, th yeah, this is the first one, the growth mindset, right? Is like, you know, are you somebody who is looking to, you know, just get better, right? Knowing that, you know, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. Are you open to them receiving feedback? I love that. So it's, Hey, I'm open to engage in these conversations, to be uncomfortable. I let you earlier said be uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. When somebody is emotional in an emotional state, they're going through something, and you're like, dude, this is so uncomfortable for me. Instead of saying, all right, well, I'm out of here. Instead of just like being there, right? How are you, how are you doing? What can, you know, what's going on? Listening, being empathetic. All of that combined is definitely areas, right? It's, you know, for who, who, who you know, who doesn't go, oh my gosh, I thrive in these environments where I just like being around emotional people and, you know, just, I just seek it out. Like, where, who else? Who else is angry or upset or enraged? I love it, you know? You're an emotion vampire. Yeah. You just go exactly. around and just like, suck it out. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uncomfortable because you're dealing with people, they're hurting, they're dealing with them, so many different things. But if you are able to lean in, but also being mindful, right? There's also levels, not lean in and be like, I'm here to rescue. I'm going to take all your pain or your sorrows away like that. No, a lot of it's also just listening, giving them the time and space, and sometimes even being okay if they're not even ready for that conversation. I've, I've dealt with that. I'm gonna, I've been a little vulnerable here, right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a people pleaser. I like to fix things. And when somebody's going through that, I'm like poking and poking. What, what can I do? What, and they're like, just leave me alone. <laughs> and I'm making it worse. I, I didn't know that. And it took time, right? It took that, that growth mindset, that feedback, and be like, I think this is my cue to step away, give them their space, and then come back later. Um, so, yeah, you cover so much. Like, I'm just, like, geeking out because it's so true that there's various different areas. Start working on one or the other, you know, maybe journaling. How did my day go? What worked, what worked for me? When I talked to Rich, he was really cool the, this day. But the next day, he was, you know, not having his best day, but I kept poking at him. And, yeah, <laughs> like, what's wrong, dude? Leave it's like, alone. leave me alone. Um, Why would you talk you know, to that, me? <laughs> that didn't work so well. So next time, I'll just give him a space, right? <laughs> Uh, so there's so yeah. much. Did, yeah. did, is there anything, any any other tips that maybe you've worked on yourself? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's it it's a lot about adapting to other people's styles. You know, as yeah. you guys both mentioned, you, it, you can't just treat everybody the same. Some people need space. Some people do need that attention and a, a little more softer approach of like, hey, you know, what's going on? Do you want to talk about it? Get it off your chest. And those are really things to keep at the you know in, in the forefront of your mind when you're dealing with any individual, especially a team, right? Because yeah. your team's may be all over the place in terms of personality so yeah as we come to as we're starting to wrap up is there um maybe if, you have any, if any of us have a story or example of us ever like implementing some of these techniques or styles that really helped us like in our in our careers so i can start off for me is just the power of empathic listening so um that right there is one of those tools as a leader that can just really help in in, in highly emotional situations is just 
being quiet and allowing that individual to just let it all out on the table without offering advice, without judging, without uh, probing, all these things that we naturally do because we want to help them. But if you can just put tone it down and just let it go and let it ride, um, a lot of times that right there alone is all they needed, right? And I've had tons of situations in my career where someone's like, hey, at the end, they're like, calm down. And I'm like, is there anything I can do? And they're like, honestly, you just did it. You listened. And uh, for me, that's been a game changer. So I don't know if, any, if you've ever experienced any tools or anything similar. For me, well, you said all the good answers, but I will, I will <laughs> tell you this. first because I, I wanted <laughs> to get the good one. <laughs> I will tell you this. It's the same approach from myself. You know, I, I, I try to come to, uh, you know, any situation as like a judgment-free zone, right? So, so you build that trust, right? So they're, they're open to giving you, you know, what, whatever that needs to be, right? That emotional, you know, I had a bad day or I don't feel great or what, whatever the case may be, right? So, uh, and I think a lot of that strategy has come from having kids and obviously there are multiple personalities and, and, you know, all children. So you have to deal with them individually as they are. So it's like, okay, well, I know with, you know, maybe my son, I need to give him time, but with my daughter, you know, I'm, I'm here for you when you need it. You may not want to talk about it now, but you know, I'm here, I'm ready to listen and I'm not going to judge you. So yeah. yeah. Same, similar well, good concept. For you. Good for you, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's you know, that's that's, that's a great um, example as well, where you can definitely, I mean, definitely use it. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Anything, anything on your on your end? Yeah. So um, I decided several years back that I was going to embrace humor, and you know, I think lawyers maybe rightfully so sometimes get a bad rap of being profoundly unfunny and I, I've certainly not not at inside of course but I, I've certainly interacted with lawyers who who completely met that description um and I was hesitant at first because I, I think there's this feeling of you know being a woman in law and being a woman in tech and being a woman in legal tech tech legal um you know, you feel this pressure of having to maybe look a certain way or sound a certain way to be taken seriously or to be thought of as competent. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I just thought, well, the hell with it. <laughs> and I, I've kind of just embraced the power of humor to break the ice, to make people feel at ease. I wrote it into my leadership philosophy. Um, it's important for us in the work that we do it is often very serious work and it has critical consequences for, you know, for the business. Um, we can take that seriously, but we don't necessarily have to take ourselves so seriously. And I really have noticed a marked increase in the positive encounters that we have, for example, with client counsel. Once you're able, I mean, it's like I can literally see it in real time, especially if we're on camera, right? You say that, you get that one kind of right little thing in there and you just, you can physically see this person relax. Like I didn't, you know, I'm not here to do battle with you. Like I left the sword and the armor suit at home, okay? And you do, you can just chill out now and you can really see it just in their whole demeanor. They're like, oh, we can actually just talk like normal human people. Like, yes, we can. And we're going to sort it out and gotten some really good feedback on our approach. And it gets us off onto such a great start, you know, on a great foot, um, starting off on, you know, especially like a new client relationship, for example. They, they remember that interaction and they're like all super charged up, like, oh, this was so great. I can't wait to start the project. That's, I mean, what, what a great way to end our segment, right? Well, because our whole theme is, per, you know, your personal brand. And I love that you just said, hey, I don't want to fit this mold. And I feel like, hey, this is something that's really not my genuine self. I want to embrace this. I want to just get at it. And then, you know, good for you. That's amazing. Thank you. Wish I had like a virtual clap. <laughs> Cue the clap track. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely some great takeaways in today's episode. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. My and pleasure. If you enjoyed the content, uh, please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and also turn on your notifications. That way you get the episodes as soon as they release. Until next time, thanks for joining us.